This is Phil Copeman, and I'll be talking about defining a computer driver for automated vehicle accountability. Common solutions to ensuring autonomous and automated vehicles are safe are insufficient. They won't get the job done in the time scale we really need. People say they'll be safer than humans, but it will take years to prove that that's true. Regulations will take many years to develop because equipment is very complicated and it's still changing. And product liability, while the companies want us to pursue product liability as the mechanism, it's not viable. And I'll have a slide that talks about that. So what can we do? What we can do is we can define the concept of a computer driver and assign it a duty of care equivalent to a human driver and then make the manufacturer responsible for negligent behavior. Now that's a lot to say, so I'm gonna spend this talk unpacking that idea. But the idea is to make sure that there's always someone in charge of safety and that it's not the driver when it's unreasonable to expect the driver to be paying attention as intently as they need to to ensure safety. Automation complacency is a thing, and any technology that says it's the driver's fault when clearly the driver can't handle it is going to lead to some unsafe outcomes. Now, this duty of care has to transfer back and forth between the driver and the machine, and it has to be crystal clear how that transfer happens, and it's unfair to stick the driver, the human driver, with the duty of care when they're really aren't capable of ensuring safety, but it's also unfair to stick the manufacturer with the duty of care when the driver legitimately should be in charge of safety. So we need to get that transfer right, and we'll talk about that. The idea here is to provide more accountability for automated vehicle safety by making the rules of engagement of who's responsible for safety when clear. Product liability is not enough. Right now, manufacturers want to say, oh yeah, product liability will take care of everything but it's not really going to work. It won't give us what we need. Manufacturers really want product liability, meaning that you can only have the manufacturer responsible for a crash if someone can prove there's a manufacturing defect, a design defect, and so on, and that the product is proven to present undue risk. Okay, so it kind of makes sense that if there's a software defect that caused a crash without any question, that should be the manufacturer's problem. That's right, and we're not saying otherwise. But the catch is that there are going to be a lot of situations where it's not so clear and proving the manufacturer has a product defect is going to be a little more than is plausible. As an example, Mercedes is putting out this feature called Drive Pilot. And when Drive Pilot is engaged, the driver is told it's okay to watch a movie, it's okay to play a video game on the dashboard, and so on. In other words, in Drive Pilot, Mercedes is telling the customers that it's okay to not watch the road. Mercedes is also telling journalists that they accept legal responsibility for problems while using DrivePilot. Well, that certainly sounds like they're accepting responsibility for crashes, but if you read the details of what they're actually providing to journalists in the detailed statements, that's not what's happening here. What they're doing is they're accepting responsibility for product liability. Well, they had to accept that anyway. That's not a voluntary thing. If you sold a defective product, you have liability for that. But what they're not doing is they're not accepting responsibility for negligent driving. So we're going to get to that in a moment. But the reason product liability doesn't give us what we need is that it's very difficult and expensive to prove product liability. You might need to do analysis of the source code, and that means setting up a secure room and paying experts to go in there and look at it. It takes hundreds, if not thousands of hours. It's super painful. It's super expensive. And for a single crash, let's say some car runs a red light or some car hits a pedestrian, it's going to be so expensive, it's really infeasible to fund that kind of effort just for one crash like that. Well, people say, what about a class action where there are a bunch of cars and we say all the cars have the same defect? Well, yeah, that is a way that this typically happens. But all those class action cars have to be the same somehow. So if um, a company, and this goes beyond Mercedes, this is any level three vehicle. If a company is updating their neural network software every week, then you have to prove that 10, 20, 30, 200 weeks of cars, all with slightly different software, are all the same car for a class action. And even if you can do that, if you have some machine learning, how exactly do you reverse engineer what's in a neural net 
to prove it's a software defect or a training defect or a bias in the training data. This is all pretty new ground for um, product liability. It's really unclear how it's going to turn out other than that it'll be really expensive. And the reality is there are plenty of crashes where this just doesn't make sense. To be sure, there will be some product liability cases and that'll be the right thing for those cases. But for the vast majority of crashes where you have to decide whether the human driver is to blame, the car is to blame, product liability is the wrong tool. It's a hammer when you need a screwdriver. It's just the wrong way to go. If you have a car that runs a red light and hits a pedestrian, it ran the red light. If the pedestrian, why does it matter which line of code or which neuron in a, in a neural network was the fault? You know that the car did something that if a human driver had done, it would be bad. So why do we need to go all the expense? We know there's a problem. Why do we have to go through all this? It just doesn't make sense. So what we should be doing is we should be minimizing the number of cases that are product liability and solving all the easy ones by something that is not a really heavy sledgehammer, something that's a little bit easier to apply and still come up with common sense, reasonable, just results. That something is tort law. I'm not a lawyer, and so I'm going to use an engineering explanation of tort law intended for engineers. Civil tort law is when you compensate a claimant who has suffered a loss. So you have to have suffered a loss. You can't sue into tort law just because something might be defective. You have to have been harmed by by something proximately caused by the negligence of another party. We're not, in this case, alleging negligent design. What we're doing is we're saying that a computer-driven car behaved in a negligent way. Well, a computer is not a person, so how does, how does that work? Well, to make that work, what we need to do is create a fictional concept called a computer driver and assign it a duty of care. So what's a duty of care? Well, a human driver has a duty of care to other road users. And if they breach that duty of care, the human driver is negligent. So you're supposed to avoid collisions you can avoid, for example. The human driver has to act as a reasonable person would act. So a reasonable person is a theoretically competent, unimpaired driver that doesn't make mistakes, but is not a super driver, not an expert. It's just a reasonable, ordinary driver. And this is done on a per incident basis. So it's not a statistical safety argument at all. It's we have this particular crash. Here are the facts for this crash. So human driver, did they behave as a reasonable person would behave? And if they did, they're not negligent. And if they did not, for example, if they ran through a red light and there was plenty of time to stop and there were no extenuating circumstances, well, then they're negligent. So a duty of care imposes a requirement on a human driver to behave in a re reasonable, non-negligent way. And what we're proposing is to take that concept and apply it to computer drivers. The reason we want to do this is to institute more accountability than there currently is. If it's going to take hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to sue a car company for a product defect, then that's a barrier for people with just claims to recover. It compromises accountability. But if we have computer drivers have the same mechanisms for claim recovery as human drivers, then that's going to improve accountability. To do this, we're going to create a legal fiction of a computer driver. So this is necessary because a computer isn't a person. It's not even a legal person like a corporation. A computer can't hold property. Uh, it can't sign contracts. It's not a person. And we don't want to make it a person, but we have to do something. So we're going to have a legal fiction of a computer driver. And we're going to define that as a sustained automated steering of a vehicle. Any computer that does sustained automated steering, that's a computer driver. It may be doing more. It probably will be doing more. It'll probably do speed control, for example. But this is an, a useful threshold decision because we've known for decades that when computers start steering a car, people start dropping out. They suffer from automation complacency. It's not really a big problem with speed control, but once you take away steering, people have trouble paying attention. So that's the right way to say that computer's really driving and the person's watching. Now that doesn't mean that the human has no obligations, but it means the computer takes the lead in driving when it assumes control of steering. And when the computer driver is steering, the manufacturer is the responsible party. So we're linking the computer to a legal person, the manufacturer, and we're making the manufacturer responsible for breaches of the duty of care. 
Now, to do this, the transfer of duty of care is key. We can't simply have that if there's a computer in the car, it's always the manufacturer's fault. That's not fair. All right. So what we need to do is know who's driving when. And the computer driver has the duty of care when it accepts a request from the human driver to steer. And the computer could say, nope, I'm outside of my operational design domain. I'm not going to accept responsibility. I'm not going to steer. But if the computer says, okay, I got it. I'm steering. It is also accepted the duty of care at the same level that it would, that a human driver would have it. Now that this, uh, Computer driver can transfer the duty of care back as long as there's sufficient notice, and we'll get into exactly how that might uh, happen depending on the automation mode. The computer driver should be held to the same standard as a human driver. So this means if there's a particular crash and a human driver had been driving and that human driver would have been negligent, then the computer driver should be negligent for the same circumstances. Does not mean the computer's always negligent. It just means they're held to the exact same standard we would normally hold a human driver to. Doesn't mean that they have to behave the same. So it's not a requirement to be exactly a human driver. It's just that if a bad thing happens, if harm is caused, and that's proximate to some behavior from the computer driver, then we ask, well, will we have blamed a human driver? Yes. Okay. We're going to blame a computer driver the same way. Now, something that's important is a large number of traffic crashes and losses are going to also have involved a breach of the rules of the road, a traffic violation. And one of the key principles that makes this pretty straightforward to apply is that if you have a loss proximately caused by a traffic law violation or involving a traffic law violation, then that's a thing called negligence per se. So if you run a red light at 30 miles an hour, as, as this person doing a test drive of an automated vehicle feature is doing, and that person were to crash, uh, somebody would be negligent per se because they ran a red light and caused a crash. So that's going to take care of most of the crashes. Uh, and we're back to, look, if the driver runs a red light and they hit something, they should be responsible. And it's a question of who was really driving. And the position we take is whoever steering is driving and in this uh, picture, in the video this came from, that would have been the computer. Statistical safety does not avoid negligence. This is a really important point. If you say, well, we have half as many crashes as a human driver, uh, that's great, but it doesn't give you a free hit. Just as a human driver, if a human driver drove a million miles and never had a crash, and then they drive through a red light and have a crash, that's not a way to get out of negligence. They're still negligent. Now, maybe if there's a criminal case, they may get um, a lighter sentence because they have good record or whatever, but Having a good record doesn't excuse the behavior. It may affect the penalty, but negligence is negligence, and, and your historical record doesn't really count there. So this is a separate thing than better than a human driver statistically. This is on a case-by-case -case basis. Did you behave in a non-negligent, reasonable driver way? The implications of defining a computer driver are that most crashes can now be handled by tort law. If a computer driver runs a red light, well, we judge it just like a human driver, and, and we don't even have to know it was in the, the computer's head. We don't have to analyze it. Running a red light is negligence per se, probably, and so there we are. Do we really need source code analysis? No, it ran a red light. These computer drivers should be subject to traffic tickets and negligence findings, the same as human drivers in the same circumstances. One of the side effects is that this avoids overwhelming the courts with product liability. The court system is going to struggle if every single collision caused by a computer driver ends up with a product liability lawsuit. Those are very complicated. There's a lot going on there. It's way different than a, than a relatively straightforward traffic law court case. And by putting everything into tort law, without changing the tort law, we're just going to add this definition. We don't have to rewrite the tort law. It's really going to make things a lot more efficient and, and I think fair. This isn't the first time someone has had to create a new legal concept for new technology. Back in the day, there were these things called electronic signatures, and people wanted them to replace pen and ink signatures, but it wasn't clear if an electronic signature actually carried legal weight or not. But no one wanted to wait the years and years it would take to sort that out. So instead, what did people say? Well, they said, let's make a law that says there's this thing called electronic signatures. Let's define what it is. And guess what? When you say signature, electronic signature, yeah, that's the signature too. Let's bring all the weight of existing law, statute, et cetera, to bear. And that's what we want to do for computer drivers. A computer driver is a driver. 
and should be treated the same for tort law purposes. Now, what does this do? It puts financial pressure on companies making computer drivers to have safe driving behavior. They're subject to the same rules. The manufacturer bears the cost from unsafe driving, which is the whole point of tort law, is to incentivize safer, better behavior. Now, this isn't going to get you completely acceptable safety for a number of reasons, but it's going to put pressure on companies to go in the correct direction, and that's a good thing. So it's a start towards safety while we're waiting the years for the regulations and all the other things to fi be figured out. Now we've defined what a duty of care is, and we've said the computer driver might have it, but also the human driver might have it. So now we have to figure out how to assign which one of them has the duty of care when. Because if we have confusion, we haven't really fixed the problem. To do this, we need an alternative to the SA levels to be used for regulation. We're not talking about engineering now, we're talking about regulation. To do that, we're going to use four modes. The first is conventional. If a human driver is continuously sustained steering, then the human driver is responsible. Now, if you have things like lane keeping assistance, which nudges you back in the lane, that's not sustained steering by a computer. That's still conventional. So we're not talking about momentary intervention being automated here. We're just talking about the human driver is steering the steering wheel. That's conventional. Human driver is responsible. Next is fully autonomous. Think robo taxis and uncrewed trucks. The computer driver is steering. The computer driver is doing everything. So the manufacturer ought to be responsible for the computer driver. Why the manufacturer, not someone else? Well, the manufacturer is the party in the best position to fix safety problems that might be there. You could try and make the vehicle owner responsible, but they don't have access to the software. How are they supposed to know whether it's safe, let alone fix a safety problem? It sort of has to be the manufacturer. The third mode is testing. So this is any vehicle that is a development vehicle. It says beta or beta testing or it's pre-production. It's not a product fit for use at, at scale without test drivers in there. So anytime there's a product that has a click through that says, by the way, this is beta, it's immature, it might try and kill you, our software isn't completely done, that's testing. And for testing, the manufacturer should be responsible to have a safe test plan and to qualify the test drivers, and they ought to be responsible for the performance of the test drivers. So if someone is harmed by a testing computer driver, the manufacturer should be the one to compensate that person. Now, the manufacturer may turn around and have a problem with the test driver, but let them sort it out. If you're a pedestrian and you're hit by a piece of experimental technology, you shouldn't be the one having to sort out who's responsible. It should be the manufacturer because they're ultimately the ones who put that equipment on the street. The fourth mode this is the tricky one. It's the awkward middle. It's supervisory mode. So that's, as the icon says, there's a driver there. They're supposed to be paying some level of attention, but they're not actually steering the car. They're just supervising what's going on. This is a unification of SAE levels two and three into a single regulatory bin. And the reason that makes sense is at level two or level three, the driver is expected to pay some level of attention and in every car and sometimes in different modes in the car, that level of attention may vary, but the driver is supposed to be there. On the other hand, the automation steering, and we know drivers are really bad at, at supervising automation. So by putting the primary burden on the manufacturer, we're pressuring them to design a safe system that ordinary people can operate safely rather than saying, well, we're going to do whatever and we'll just blame the humans so we don't have to worry about safety. That's going to lead to unsafe outcomes. So here the computer is steering and it's probably also controlling speed and so on, but steering is the bright line difference between whether it's in supervisory mode or conventional mode and the human's supposed to supervise. When activated, when it accepts control of steering, the computer driver accepts the duty of care and the human role is determined by the operational concept. The manufacturer can tell the human to do whatever they want. They can say, pay attention. They can say, take a nap. But we don't really care because the manufacturer has the duty of care and it's up to them to make sure the human's doing whatever is expected of them, which will vary depending on the vehicle and the feature. Now, the computer driver can relinquish the duty of care. So if the computer driver decides that it can't handle what's going on in a supervisory mode, it's okay for the computer driver to insist that the person take control back. But it has to do so for one of two reasons. The first is driver monitoring violation. 
and the second is due to exiting the operational design domain. So in driver monitoring violation, the computer driver is responsible for monitoring that the person is at as attentive as they need to be. So it's possible that if the computer driver says, hey, uh, person, you're supposed to notice a parked fire truck in the middle of the highway, that the person might be responsible if they crash into a fire truck, but not if the person hasn't been looking at the road. The computer driver has an obligation to ensure the person's as attentive as they need to be and to alarm and put duty of care back on the driver if the person is not being as attentive as they need to be. Similarly, these systems won't work everywhere, and, and that's okay, but when they're not working, they have to pass control back to the human driver. They can't just keep working and then blame the human for not noticing. For example, if they don't work in rain and it starts raining, the computer should be telling the driver, hey, human driver, it's raining. I can't work in the rain. You're going to have to take control rather than just blaming the human driver for a crash when maybe the person didn't even realize that the light mist qualified as rain. How would they know? There's an important thing here. The computer can't just dump control back in the lap of the human. There needs to be a transition time that's reasonable, and probably it has to be at least 10 seconds. Anything less than 10 seconds is probably making an unreasonable ask. It's um, pretty clear that in many cases it's a lot longer than 10 seconds. So the 10 seconds is not a mandatory cutoff, but rather a safe harbor. If the computer says, hey, human driver, take over, and it's been less than 10 seconds before a crash, the computer driver still has duty of care. After 10 seconds, if it makes sense in that circumstance, then the duty of care is returned to the human driver. The computer driver still has to do best effort in case the human doesn't pick up the slack. But at some point, it's the human's driver's fault for not uh, regaining control. Uh, and there's going to have to be some reasonableness language given the driver monitor. If the driver was allowed to go to sleep by the driver monitor and then expected to come fully awake and regain control and process a complicated situation, that's not going to be reasonable. This is going to depend on the design concept and ultimately this will have to be figured out by a jury. But the point is here, you have to give the driver at least 10 seconds to take over and give them warning that they need to take over either because they've not been paying the attention they need to pay or because you're exiting the operational design domain. Defining this computer driver concept is pretty urgent. We've known for a long time that once you take over automated steering, drivers going to have trouble paying attention. Asking a person to supervise automation, we've known for decades. We've known since the 1940s, people are terrible at that. And expecting cars to be safe, where you're asking a human to do something they're terrible at, isn't going to work out if your plan is to just blame the human. Every time you blame a human for not paying attention, that's not going to stop the next one. You're just going to have crash after crash after crash, and nothing will change if there's not pressure on the manufacturers to design a system. I didn't say it would be perfect. I didn't say the human can do whatever they want and get away with it. What I'm saying is they have to have a carefully considered human-computer interface that appropriately assigns responsibility to the driver and ensures that the system is being used as intended. Now, we could go with net risk metrics, and people will say, well, as long as it's safer than a human, maybe that's okay. But we're not going to know that for a long time. It's really hard to measure. And uh, we're going to say, well, we can't have equipment regulations. Well, those are still maturing. It's going to be years before we have equipment regulations that really cover a wide variety of driving. We're just seeing the first ones of those that only cover very special cases. Uh, and net risk, saying safer than human, doesn't deal with things like what if the pedestrian fatality rate is increased even though the net risk goes down? Uh, solutions for all these things are needed, but they're going to take time. While we wait for that, we need something to really put a check and balance in place to make sure that the cars with automated driving features being put out on the street have reasonable safety, that they're not making unreasonable demands on drivers that drivers just can't do. And defining a computer driver concept gets us there. It's compatible with what many companies are selling. What we're saying is really... It's okay to have automated steering, but your driver monitoring has to really work, and you have to enforce the design limits. That's not particularly unreasonable, and lots of companies are basically doing that right now. So we're just trying to formalize that, and we're only imposing the same requirements for negligence that human drivers already have. So we're not setting a higher bar for cars with computer drivers. We're just saying they should be held accountable to the same level. But the important thing is this will hold companies accountable for the cost of mishaps, 
and put financial pressure on them to make sure they're only deploying automated vehicle features, regardless of the SAA level, that have reasonable safety because they're not behaving in a way that if a human driver were behaving, we would consider negligent.